for Coach in Malahat Langford. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, really glad to be able to take part in the debate on Bill C-74, and I'm glad because I'm getting an opportunity that unfortunately many of my colleagues right. will not get, because as uh, all colleagues uh, will know, we are now debating this bill under time allocation yet again, uh, which was given notice last night uh, in the wee hours of the night uh, when, when a few of us were still here maintaining our presence until midnight. And then, of course, the government uh, moved the motion on time allocation earlier today. Uh, now, I think the 40th occurrence when it has done this, in spite of its election promises to work with parliamentarians to show more respect for this place, uh, it's the kind of action that basically breeds a lot of cynicism for politics, when people promise something and do the complete opposite. And I would dare say that uh, a lot of people who did vote for the Liberals in the last election we're expecting a lot better than they're currently getting. But uh, we'll, we'll revisit that issue in 2019, Mr. Speaker, and I'll, I'll be very happy to talk in depth with my constituents about that. Uh, nevertheless, uh, let's get to the issue at hand. Bill C-74 is the Government's Budget Implementation Act for this year, for 2018. Uh, it is a bill that uh, clocks in at a, a hefty 556 pages. I'm not, I don't have a copy of the bill before me, but I can assure you, Mr. Speaker, it also serves well as a, as a giant doorstop. It, uh, it amends 44 separate acts, and uh, one of them is actually the, uh, includes a, a measure to establish a new greenhouse gas pricing act. And, and we in the NDP believe that because of the, how big this bill and how much debate there is over carbon pricing right now, we, we believe that particular aspect of this bill could have existed as a standalone bill uh, to give it that the more fulsome debate that it deserves. Um, but there's a problem with introducing bills of this size and trying to ram them through the legislative process in a, in a quick manner. And, and the reason for that, Mr. Speaker, is that you, you can sometimes lose the fine little details. And it was discovered, I think, last week or a couple of weeks ago that there's a measure buried in C-74 under Part 6, Division 20, which appears to allow prosecutors to suspend criminal charges against companies in certain cases of corporate wrongdoing. Now, we might legitimately ask in this House, why is a criminal justice matter appearing in a budget bill? And I, I very much ask that question. I, I had the honor of serving as the NDP's justice critic last year, and I would expect such a measure to be in a criminal justice bill and to be studied at the appropriate committee, namely the Standing Committee on Justice and Human Rights. And, and don't take my word for it, Mr. Speaker. We have quotes here for the Liberal MP for Hall Elmer, who was a member of the Finance Committee, and he said that the government uh, seems to be, quote, letting those with means have an easier time of it than those who don't have means, end quote. And the Liberal MP for Malpec, who is the uh, Finance Committee's chair, uh, also said that, uh, quote, there is a huge question whether this should be in a budget bill, end quote. So two Liberal MPs, having discovered this, raised legitimate questions. But what did the Liberal-dominated Finance Committee do? It left that provision in, Mr. Speaker, and it sent it right to the House, and here is where it's at. So that's one of the big problems with omnibus bills. When you start throwing in all of these different acts, and someone who thinks they're pretty clever in the PMO's office says, well, you know, we can just slip this in, and I, I don't think it will get noticed. Well, they got caught this time, Mr. Speaker. And, and I think that, uh, you know, I don't know the merits of this particular part, but what it deserved was to go to the appropriate committee, to the Justice Committee, so that it, in its expertise, could call forth the appropriate witnesses to deliberate as to whether this is uh, really a good provision to have. It's not a measure that the Finance Committee is equipped to deal with, not when you're dealing with a 556-page bill. But, Mr. Speaker, I want to turn my, my, uh, my next um, part of my speech towards the, the Greenhouse uh, Gas uh, Pollution Pricing Act. Um, we, we do believe that this should have been put into a separate bill. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm one of the people who believes that uh, we do need to have a, a price in carbon. I think that the evidence of uh, climate change is there for all to see. And, 
and we need to take some leadership. But there's still a big debate going on in this country, and I believe it would have been uh, to the government's advantage to have split this off into a separate bill and to study it on its own merits. And that way we could have called forth witnesses who have expertise in this area who could have offered the appropriate testimony as to why carbon pricing schemes work, and, and moreover, to, to uh, you know, deal with my conservative colleagues' concerns about carbon pricing, they could have maybe offered some suggestions on how the government can mitigate the costs to low-income families and the costs to industries that are very fossil fuel reliant. And, you know, speaking as the uh, NDP's critic for agriculture, um, one of those sectors is, is in agriculture. And, you know, the, uh, the Canadian Produce Marketing Association and the Canadian Horticultural Society, uh, they do have a problem with one aspect of Bill C-74 under Part 5. Um, they, they would like to see that uh, the definitions in the bill relating to farming, they want them to encompass all primary agricultural activities and ensure qualifying farm fuel includes natural gas and propane, which are increasingly common in the agricultural sector. And they believe that after uh, their consultation and research, that the definitions in that part are incomplete and they do not capture all of the primary agriculture activities. So agriculture is one of those parts where, you know, farmers have to drive their tractors. They have to uh, use natural gas to, to heat up their greenhouses. And it's a sector that's currently, under current models, very reliant on fossil fuels. We, we know there is a lot of innovation and research and effort being made to transition off that. But the case as it stands now is that it is still heavily reliant. And I think that uh, you know, farmers, given that so many of them live so close to the margins and that this government has an ambitious agenda of meeting $75 billion worth of exports by the year 2025, I believe that this is a part uh, that could have been studied if this part had been part of a standalone bill. And I know that I, as the ag critic, would have loved to have uh, given some, uh, some notice on, on behalf of my party and on behalf of interested stakeholders. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I also want to talk about a, a few of the missed opportunities. I, uh, I covered this in an exchange earlier today, uh, just about, you know, the fact that there are no real measures in this bill to deal with tax evasion and avoidance. Uh, this is an issue that we've seen time and time again in Canada where the wealthy and well-connected are able to use tools at their disposal that just ordinary Canadians don't, and they are not paying their fair share. Uh, the Liberals failed to live up to a promise to, to go ahead with getting rid of tax loopholes that are associated with stock options for rich CEOs. And again, we see a failure to effectively deal with the corporate tax rate. Like, as I mentioned before, corporations benefit from tax dollars being spent here. Our tax dollars build the infrastructure, like the bridges, like the roadways, the railways, that help them move their product. Uh, our tax dollars pay for the administration of a legal system that ensures they live under the rule of law. And if they ever have a conflict with a customer or a regulatory agency, that the, the rule of law is there for them to work. And our tax dollars also pay for social services that many workers require because they're not being paid a living wage. Uh, so that's another issue that needs to be addressed. And I, and I know that many of my colleagues in this House have those situations with their constituents where they're working full-time jobs but are still struggling to get by. They're having to make those hard choices between paying the rent and putting good quality food on the table. I'll end, Mr. Speaker, uh, just talking about uh, the, you know, the government's recent, recent purchase of the Kinder Morgan pipeline for $4.5 billion. Um, that was certainly not a part of their election platform, and it was not mentioned in the 2018 budget. So uh, they are going to have to explain to this House and to Canadians where that money is coming from. Are they going to raise it from uh, the Canada Pension Plan? Are they going to raise it from tax dollars? We would like to really see where that money is coming from. And I think when you look at gaping holes in our infrastructure, especially rural broadband, uh, the situation with uh, drinking water quality on First Nations reserves, the fact that this government can pony up $4.5 billion for a piece of infrastructure that belongs in the 20th century, but 
ignores all of these other problems that are so prevalent in the rest of the country really goes to the heart of where the priorities of this Liberal government are. Here, here. Mr. Speaker, I see that uh, I'm in the closing second, so with that I will conclude. And again, I appreciate this opportunity to speak to Bill C-74. Thank you. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Winnipeg North. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And you know, I listened very closely as the member commented in regards to taxation policies and the type of things that the member doesn't make reference to is the hundreds of millions of additional dollars in two budgets that this government has put in to go after uh, tax uh, evaders. The member doesn't make mention, Mr. Speaker, of the 1% or the tax that was put on Canada's 1% wealthiest of the country, of which I'll remind the member across the way, he voted against that tax on Canada's wealthiest 1%. The, person, the member doesn't make mention of the tax cut that was given to the middle class or uh, the uh, literally hundreds of millions that went through the Canada Child Benefit. Or what about the GIS, Mr. Speaker? Again, hundreds of millions. Both of those programs lifted, whether you're seniors or children, out of poverty by the thousands. Yet the NDP consistently vote against those types of uh, measures. My question to the member across the way, does he have any regret in terms of not supporting some of those tax cuts to our middle class, some of those programs that have lifted thousands of children and seniors out of poverty. The Honourable Member for Cavachin, Malahat Langford. Well, Mr. Speaker, I didn't make mention of those because that debate is now two years old, but I can revisit it if the <laughs> member for Winnipeg North wants me to. Uh, you know, speaking of seniors, this government has still failed to live up to its promise to establish a seniors price index. That was a clear promise that they've broken. And with respect to the tax cuts for the middle class, you know, they keep on saying this, but they, they fail to define who the middle class is. This was not a middle tax. To class tax uh, cut. This was a middle tax bracket tax cut. It started for people earning $45,000 a year and, and went up to $90,000. So you know what? Every Liberal member of Parliament gave themselves the maximum tax cut. For the median income in Canada being under $45,000, people in my constituency got zero. Here. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for ladies, uh, Nanaimo Ladysmith. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to hear more about my colleague from Cowichan, Malahat Langford's uh, view, and especially what he's hearing in his riding, as I am in mine, about people's uh, absolute astonishment that this uh, Liberal government, having said to veterans, for example, you are asking for more than, than we can give you, uh, how what confidence we should have in a Liberal government that negotiated somehow found $4.5 billion to buy the discredited old 65-year-old uh, Kinder Morgan pipeline, which was valued in 2007 at just $550 million. I mean, does the government really believe that it has increased in value so much in the, that 10 years since Kinder Morgan bought the asset? And, and what does that say about this government's priorities? The Honourable Member for Couch in Malahat Langford. Well, I thank my colleague from Nanaimo, Lady Smith, my fantastic neighbour to the north, uh, for that question. And I, I'm sure she will join me in recognizing the amazing work of the member for Courtney Alberni, who serves as our new Veterans Affairs mm -hmm. critic. And you know, she, like I, we, we have spent many years working with veterans in our communities. And I think that uh, when we, uh, we hear phrases that veterans are asking for too much, I think that's a very shameful comment. And I'm sure the Prime Minister regrets making that. But the fact is, is that I believe we have a social, moral, and, and economic co covenant with people who wear the uniform. And when we ask them to do service on our behalf, uh, we owe it to them that when they retire, when they need help, whether it's with mental or physical pain or trauma, that we're there with them every step of the way, and, and that should be part of the full costing of any kind of military engagement that we put in. That it's a continuous care from the moment that they sign up to the moment that they leave to the moment that they are in their old age. We have to be looking after our veterans. It's the least we can do for asking them to do so much for us. Resuming debate, the Honourable 